we're going to start with an introduction to what an API gateway is, because still to this day, there's a lot of confusion about that terminology. Uh, we're going to give a quick nod to API management, uh, how that fits in with API gateway strategies and uh, so on. Uh, we're going to look at some core use cases for API gateways, both inside and outside of a Kubernetes environment. Uh, and the demo component, of course, is going to look at API gateway use cases uh, within Kubernetes specifically. Uh, and at the end, as uh, already mentioned, uh, we should have time for uh, some Q&A. So yeah, my name is Leif Beaton. I'm the Global Channel Technical Lead for F5. Uh, my email address is on screen for uh, those of you that want to jot that down. Um, now, let's break into the gist of things. Let's start off with a quick poll, because we like to throw people into the deep end of the pool uh, right from the get-go. The two questions here are, where are you with Kubernetes? Uh, and you'll find the alternatives on screen. And secondly, who are you? The poll should be on screen for you guys uh, right now. I suppose I should answer as well, shouldn't I? leave you a little bit of time to uh, to complete the poll okay about about 70 oh all about 80 percent have responded yeah I'll, I'll 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 leave it to you it's very rare to see a hundred percent so i'll leave it to you to uh, to see where it tails off <laughs> well we're right at about a minute here so i'm going to go ahead and end the poll for now yeah um, it looks like 40% uh, uh, are just getting started with Kubernetes, followed by 37% working at an organization using a hybrid of traditional Kubernetes apps. Mm -hmm. As far as who we are, it looks like about 50% is an admin or operator, uh, followed by 38% uh, developers. Excellent. So there's a, there's a nice spread, and uh, we love to see that, of course. Um, now, it's not surprising to see a relatively high uh, percentage of, um, of attendees being reasonably new to Kubernetes. Uh, even though it's been around for years, it's, um, it's been considered a bit of a beast to tame. And in some regards, I understand that. In others, it's not as complicated or... or um, uh, mystical as uh, it may appear on the face of it. That being said, it's always good to be able to explain these things to uh, to people while they're getting their feet wet. So I'm I'm happy about that. Um, with that in mind, let's just pop on over to this slide. So, what is an API gateway? API gateway as a terminology is being thrown around left, right, and center uh, in the industry today. And for good reason. I mean, it solves a lot of problems. An API gateway is an essential tool for a modern architecture, but it's not a product. That's something that we need to make clear uh, from the get-go. An API gateway in itself isn't a specific product. It's a set of use cases that a number of different products can uh, fulfill. So an API gateway is very typically a reverse proxy and load balancer with a number of policies uh, at play, uh, as well as, as some uh, additional functionality around the, uh, uh, the reverse proxy uh, load balancer. Things like uh, authorization control and um, uh, potentially Authentication and access control, single sign-on solutions could be a part of it, uh, but certainly authorization through things like JOT tokens or, uh, or uh, strategies to that effect. So the API gateway isn't a specific product. It's a set of use cases. Uh, the API gateway will typically sit in a position uh, similar to where you would see um, an ADC, an application delivery controller, right? One of the things that the API gateway uh, should be able to do is things like uh, facade routing. So uh, what is facade routing? Well, if we're looking at the, the uh, overview here, 
we have, uh, for instance, our warehouse API here. And we, when we look at the URIs, we see that there are uh, different paths at play here, slash API, slash warehouse, slash inventory, likewise, slash API, slash warehouse, slash pricing, and so on and so forth. Uh, the client, the consumer of uh, our API or APIs shouldn't be concerned about where these APIs are, as in do they sit on Kubernetes cluster one or Kubernetes cluster two, or do they sit outside of a Kubernetes cluster, nor should the consumer be concerned about how many replicas of a specific uh, API do we have. Do we have three inventory services as uh, indicated on the display here? Uh, do we have uh, three pricing services? Do we have 30? Do we have one? The client doesn't care, it shouldn't care, and it shouldn't know. All of this is the pur uh, purpose of the API gateway. Uh, also, the API gateway should be able to unify access to potentially several sources. So we have our warehousing API consisting of several sub APIs here. Uh, we may have other APIs that's residing uh, entirely elsewhere and perhaps uh, also governed by an entirely different set of policies at play. All of these things should be uh, uh, taken care of uh, uh, by the API gateway. And returning to what I talked about facade routing, uh, a modern API gateway should also be able to ex uh, expose something as a single API. As for instance, uh, let's say for, uh, for the sake of argument that our slash API slash warehouse slash inventory API is in fact gathering information from multiple different APIs on the back end. It might be multiple different APIs required to, uh, to give the response to the inventory request. Uh, it could be APIs uh, dealing with uh, specific product information. Uh, it should uh, could be APIs that specifically just looking at how many items of this do I have in stock. And all of that gets tied together in one presumably JSON object that's going to be responded to the API client. Essentially, when we're talking about API uh, or APIs in plural, we're talking about uh, a contractual relationship between a client and an end endpoint. So the API contract stipulates how should a request look? Uh, what format should the request uh, have? Are there potentially a set of headers that I need to see in the request in order for uh, for me to be able to fulfill it, et cetera, et cetera. And inversely, uh, the contract also stipulates how is my response gonna look? So uh, generally speaking, uh, we're most often talking about RESTful APIs, which very typically would use JSON as a, a data transport format. Uh, is the JSON object going to follow a specific schema, which is very often the case? And if it falls outside of that schema, then uh, likely the API gateway would discard it and uh, yield an uh, erroneous response of some format. So the API gateway fulfills a number of different tasks that you are seeing in environments that does not classify itself as an API delivery system. Uh, the API gateway shares a lot of DNA with traditional load balancers, with traditional Active Directory controllers, with traditional uh, ingress controllers, and also elements of service mesh, which we'll talk about briefly in a later slide. So when would we use an API gateway? Well, typically, these sort into one out of three verticals. Uh, you have resilience use cases, traffic management use cases, and I have apparently forgotten to put myself on do not disturb, apologies for that, uh, and security use cases. Uh, so uh, under resiliency, we see things like A-B testing, canary deployments, blue-green deployments, uh, and the likes. We also see protocol transformation. Uh, a very typical example here is if you have a legacy um, API uh, that speaks SOAP or XML, you might want to transform that to JSON uh, bidirectionally, so between the clients and the, uh, and the endpoints. Policies like rate limiting, et cetera, et cetera. And um, also, of course, service discovery. 
Under the traffic management use cases, we're looking at uh, method routing and matching uh, and request and response header and body manipulation. Body, of course, being an edge case that we typically would like to architect ourselves away from due to its uh, relative heavy lifting approach uh, to things, but nonetheless, pretty much anything that deals with the OC model layer seven uh, would fit into that side of things. And then, of course, security use cases uh, is in play as well. So, uh, as I briefly hinted towards API schema enforcement, uh, the request body perhaps needs to look uh, according to this schema, and the response body needs to look according to that schema. And what do we do if anything falls outside of those uh, cases? Uh, authentication and authorization takes place uh, in this use case as well. Uh, custom responses. Uh, obviously, a RESTful API uh, call wouldn't adhere to the typical HTTP response codes. Uh, so you wouldn't see necessarily a 200 re response in the API itself. Uh, you typically see that on the um, uh, in the HTTP header, but you might want to see a different kind of a response from a, uh, from a, an API endpoint. And of course, these responses are fully customizable, uh, and you'll, you'll find that different API endpoints may adhere to different standards there. Uh, TLS termination is also a very typical uh, use case for the API gateway. And as you can see, all of these elements individually fit into traditional uh, application delivery controller mechanisms as well, right? So uh, essentially what I'm trying to say here is an API gateway isn't a mystical, magical device uh, that just happens to speak uh, API natively. It is essentially um, a reverse proxy in its simplest of, um, of definitions. It's a reverse proxy that has some additional functionality and, um, uh, and policies at play. Let me see here real quick there. So that leads us into uh, our second poll. Uh, two questions again. How many APIs does your organization have? Uh, if any, and uh, are your APIs uh, internal or external? Just to give you guys a moment to uh, to have a look at that. We'll give people a, another second or here, but we're looking pretty good, right at about 70%. Yeah, the, it's uh, it's rare that it goes much be, uh, much above 80, I'd say. I know that we've gotten some great participation today. Mm. Uh, okay, so for question number one, how many APIs does your organization have? Uh, it looks like um, we're on kind of a nice little bell curve here. 25% uh, between 11 and 50. Um, next highest being one to 10, 22%. Uh, and then kind of a, a change here, more than 122%. Uh, nice, so nice. Good spread there. And uh, are your APIs external or internal? It looks like 65% said both. Also, also nice. It, uh, I mean, this shows that APIs have uh, have matured into the mainstream, right? Uh, if we had asked the same question not more than two, three, maybe four years ago, we would see a very, very different reality. Uh, and and this is excellent. I mean, APIs. Uh, allow us to construct software in a very different way than we would have done traditionally. Uh, traditionally, it was, well, a monolithic approach to everything, which meant uh, a lot of things, really. But principally, it meant that my ingenious piece of software here, my ingenious function that does something specific, only fits within my monolith and only does things for me. Uh, with, with an API, 
approach, all of a sudden it opens the possibility for having uh, previously thought of impossible functionality within our applications. Uh, if I'm developed if I'm developing an application for, uh, say, um, keeping track of my motorcycle rides or stuff of that nature, then I can now, with relative ease, without having that kind of expertise uh, personally, I can very easily in incorporate mapping capabilities using something like Google Maps or Bing Maps or anything of that nature, simply consuming their APIs to put that functionality into my application and make it appear as a, a, a native overall application um, externally, which is brilliant. So, uh, and with regards to the numbers, uh, the bulk of them would seem to have at least double digit APIs, which is really, really interesting. Uh, because that's where things start getting, uh, how to put it? I, I'm hesitant to use the word complex, but the complexity does increase where, uh, with the number of APIs in terms of how do we route traffic to these things. Uh, in an unorchestrated environment, uh, API management becomes a, a critical component at that stage because our individual gateways, you'll typically end up with more than one, would have their specific um, configuration. And keeping track of what configuration goes where can become uh, well, very, very tricky. Uh, the higher the number of APIs, the higher the complexity, of course, and more automated systems would be required to keep the, uh, these things in, uh, in check. Cool, well, thanks for the responses there. Uh, moving along. When should we use an API gateway in Kubernetes? The eagle-eyed observer would note that this slide bears a striking resemblance to uh, one we just looked at. Uh, the difference being, of course, that two of the elements here have been grayed out. The reason for that is uh, using an API gateway outside of Kubernetes, you have the entire list available to you, but when you put an API gateway inside of the Kubernetes environment, uh, these two elements, uh, so protocol transformation under resiliency and uh, request response manipulation under traffic management, uh, should typically not be part of the equation. The reason for that is both these are uh, quite computationally heavy. They're, uh, they're quite expensive from a computational point of view. And generally speaking, they're only required or uh, necessary when you're dealing with legacy type APIs. So things like, uh, like SOAP, for instance, which isn't particularly Kubernetes friendly. And Kubernetes was born uh, when SOAP was already on the steady decline. So uh, it's quite natural that these things are reasonably mutually exclusive. Is it impossible to run a SOAP-based API inside of Kubernetes? Of course not. Is it against typical uh, patterns? Absolutely. So you would generally not want to use these, uh, these types of approaches when you put an API gateway inside of Kubernetes. Uh, that's not to say that they're unavailable to you. They are uh, absolutely present so long as your um, your tool, be that for instance, Nginx Plus, does have it available, then yeah, you can use it within Kubernetes as well. The point here is you absolutely shouldn't. You should think long and hard and try to architect yourself away from that kind of a solution. So that uh, brings us into where can API gateway use cases be achieved? Uh, we can very simplistically split it, split it into three uh, scenarios. So at the front door, uh, meaning uh, outside of your Kubernetes cluster, uh, this is, well, where the rest of the world lives, so to speak. Uh, and um, th this kind of makes sense if your policies needs to be applied on a global scale. So if you're dealing with multiple clusters, that kind of an approach. Uh, number two here is at the edge, which is where the north-south traffic takes place uh, between your Kubernetes environment and everything else. Uh, so if you have policies that needs to be applied to the entire cluster, uh, this is where you would take care of that approach. 
And finally, number three, at the services level, which would generally, um, uh, we would be talking about the east-west or intra-service communication at that stage. Uh, so that's policy enforcement on uh, intra-service communication. Should pages be allowed to, uh, so should service A and pages be allowed to talk directly to service B or service C? Or should it have to go through somewhere else? Uh, should it not be allowed to talk to it at all, et cetera, et cetera. So in terms of tool sets uh, on these three uh, locations, if you will, uh, in scenario one, uh, at, uh, outside of the Kubernetes environment, that's typically uh, taken care of by a load balancer or, or more accurately an, active, uh, an application delivery controller. At the perimeter uh, where we're dealing with the uh, north-south, that would typically be taken care of by an ingress controller in, uh, in Kubernetes lingo. And internally uh, for the services, for the intra-service communication, once we start talking a certain level of complexity or a certain number of services, it would be beneficial to look at something like a service mesh to, uh, to take care of that. Uh, that being because in the uh, intra-service communication, if we're putting a, uh, an API gateway or anything really to facilitate the policy enforcement there, it would generally be employed as a sidecar to the individual pods. Uh, and those sidecars will each and every one of them will require its unique configuration. There isn't a single configuration that you can spit out to all of them. Well, I say that. I suppose you could technically do it, but it would be an exercise in futility, uh, to, to put it mildly. So yeah, uh, these are from a bird's eye perspective, what tool sets uh, or what approach would fit best at each of those scenarios. So then, uh, what type of tool is best for Kubernetes? The simple answer to that uh, would be a Kubernetes native tool. So wh what is a Kubernetes native tool? What are we talking about there? Well, we're, we're talking about tool sets that are typically specifically designed for Kubernetes. More generally speaking, they need to be able to communicate using YAML. So uh, receiving YAML instruction sets from Kubernetes, and uh, ultimately it can convert that YAML instruction set into whatever internal structure it uses, but it needs to be able to speak it. Uh, equally, it should be able to output YAML to Kubernetes uh, if needs be as well. Very typically, we would uh, see it deployable using Kubernetes-friendly tools like Helm and the likes, uh, and it needs to be able to communicate with Kubernetes uh, standard tools to, like, for instance, Kube Control. Cool. That leads us into uh, the demo portion of today, which is uh, perhaps uh, the, the fun part. So I'm going to swap over to, uh, to uh, my environment here. So in uh, Kubernetes node right now, it's uh, Kubernetes node number one. This particular environment has three separate uh, Kubernetes instances uh, or, or uh, nodes, uh, K8S1, 2, and 3. Uh, I'm simply working on this one because one is the first number. Uh, you could obviously do this from wherever. Uh, so what are we going to do here? Well, uh, the environment is already set up for us uh, in the interest of time. So first, let's have a look at, uh, at what we have in terms of an ingress controller. So if... Uh, if I uh, run kubectl get pods on the namespace engine, nginx dash ingress, I see that I have indeed an nginx ingress controller here. Uh, I can step into that ingress controller to see what it actually is. Well, I could, for that matter, execute the command from outside the ingress controller. But uh, so now I'm inside of my ingress controller. You see the prompt changed, uh, and we can have a look at. Uh, uh, okay, so that didn't have uh, like so. So we see that in this ingress controller is running on uh, Debian 10, and we can have a look at what Nginx version we're running here. 
And we see that this ingress controller uh, is based upon an image running Nginx Plus. So this is an Nginx Plus based ingress controller, which is great news for us. Uh, cool. So we have the ingress controller sitting up and running uh, as is. Uh, and I'm going to just do a couple of things here. Two seconds. Um, there. Um, if I go back here, uh, so the ingress controller would be this fella here, right? Uh, that's the one we were looking at just now. So uh, what else do we have uh, to play around with? Uh, I'm gonna quick look at what we have here. Yeah, so I'm gonna go into the uh, folder and we should have some YAML files available to us here, yeah. So uh, the ingress controller is set up with a um, uh, with this cafe virtual server YAML. So let's have a look at what that one has uh, uh, in terms of instructions. So uh, we're using a virtual server. Uh, traditionally, ingress controllers were specified and configured using annotations, uh, and you can still do that by all means. Uh, however, it's quite limited uh, because that means you're you're limited to the features that uh, the Kubernetes project has specified as features of an ingress controller, uh, meaning that you would leave a lot of features of, for instance, Nginx Plus uh, on the table, and you wouldn't be able to utilize them uh, because the specifications weren't there for them in terms of annotations. So to rectify that situation, the Kubernetes project uh, implemented custom annotations, uh, which allowed us to uh, to specify annotations, allowing us to add features from the uh, from the data plane, from say Nginx Plus, for instance, uh, uh, into our ingress controller without that being explicitly specified by the Kubernetes project. Uh, that's better. However, that was problematic in itself uh, as well, because, well, for, for, for a number of reasons, one of them being that the custom annotations were typically specified globally, uh, which meant it was complicated, very, very complicated for uh, complex organizations to get exactly the, uh, the flow that they wanted in their traffic. Uh, the virtual server kind uh, allows for a, a much, much more flexible uh, approach to uh, to specifying your and configuring up your ingress controller, so we're using that by default. Um, yeah, so all of this is pretty self-explanatory. We're looking for a, a host name of cafe.example.com. Uh, we're we have some secrets defined so, uh, uh, certificates and keys for um, TLS. Uh, we have some upstream services uh, specified, we're exposing some ports, and then we're setting up some layer seven routing rules, uh, uh, path matching slash coffee on here and slash T, uh, and what we will do with that. What I want you guys to pay attention to here is that we're doing some um, uh, request method matching. So what we're doing is if the request is coming in as posts, we are going to uh, yield a 403 and reject that request. If it's not coming in as post, it will not fit this match, right? So it'll bypass this entire conditional match. Uh, and for slash coffee, if it isn't post, it'll be proxy passed to the coffee uh, deployment uh, or service, rather, in this case. Uh, for the T, there's nothing special there. And a request comes in for T, it'll be proxy passed to T, uh, simple as. But this uh, indicates the whole uh, whole element we talked about earlier about uh, method-based uh, matching and routing. Um, so let's go ahead and play around with that. Uh, we are, let's see, I'm just going to get the pods here again. So we have two pods here. If we look up here, uh, uh, let me have a quick look at that one. 
Yeah, there we go. So uh, the cafe.yaml uh, is uh, specifying the deployments on the service, right? So here for the coffee deployment, we see we have two replicas. And we set up a service for the coffee mm -hmm. as well and all of those things. And then we're setting up the deployment for tea with one replica and the service for uh, tea as well. So when I was looking at the pods here, you'll note that I do indeed have the two expected pods or replicas of the coffee uh, and the one of tea. The walkthrough one isn't relevant for this particular lab, so we can disregard that. So uh, let's have a quick look at the ingress controller again. Uh, there. It is indeed running, everything is fine. Uh, so yeah, low balancer type, all of that's good. And let's have a quick look at the host file as well to see that I'm actually resolving stuff here. There we go, it was hidden here at the top. So I, I have a resolution in uh, ATC host for cafe.example.com. Cool, so that means uh, I'm gonna use a curl command here. Uh, most of you will know exactly what this is doing given the number of architects we have on the call and so on. Uh, but essentially, I'm I'm running a get command here. Uh, I it would do get by default, but I put the method in explicitly just so we can see it. I'm also using the insecure uh, uh, flag here, and the reason for that is there it's a self signed certificate for this fella, so curl would just yield errors if I didn't use the insecure bit. So what am I going to request here? Well, I'm going to request uh, cafe.example.com. Uh, slash coffee. So we should expect to see a 200 response on this because it's not post, right? And indeed, that's exactly what we're seeing. HTTP 200, everything's fine uh, on the slash coffee URI. But what happens, I wonder, if I run a post with some data? So it's the same request, but I'm now using the HTTP verb of post, and I'm also including some data, um, so an upload body. Other than that, it's the same request. So if everything's correct, I now expect to see a 443, uh, a 403, I'm sorry, forbidden. And indeed, that's what we see. And the message, you are rejected, as we saw in uh, okay. Uh, dash virtual boom. Uh, that's this bit at play, right? So the moment we saw a post uh, request, it fits into this con conditional matching, and we're yielding an HTTP 403 with a body of you are rejected. So that is this element at play working exactly the way it's supposed to. So uh, this is an illustration of uh, how we can manipulate things at the Kubernetes ingress controller uh, side of, uh, of the game. And you can do so much more than this, obviously. You can have policies at play. You can have uh, web application firewalling. Uh, uh, you can do rate limiting, connection limits, all sorts of, uh, of funky stuff. So. Uh, Again, most of the use cases of an API gateway can be facilitated simply through the Nginx uh, ingress controller for Kubernetes because of uh, the strength of the virtual, uh, virtual server type. But what about a service mesh then? Because uh, hopefully at least some of you are aware that Nginx has uh, uh, positioned themselves in the service mesh side of the game for a while now as well. So what can we do there? Well, uh, we saw earlier, I'm just going to run, uh, uh, get the pods again so we can have a look at that. We saw earlier we have these fellas here, uh, and these are just standard uh, standard pods, nothing special about them. Uh, but I have uh, Nginx Service Mesh installed on this system as well. Uh, and there's a command for, uh, uh, for the Nginx Service Mesh similar to Cube Control that looks like this, nginx dash mesh control. And I'm just gonna uh, give it the parameter of config to see how it's currently configured. So I get the configuration uh, for the nginx service mesh. And what I want to highlight here is this bit here, right? So I have an injection here, 
and I have uh, disabled namespaces is an empty collection. Enabled namespaces is a collection consisting of a namespace called tcream. What does this mean? Well, it means that the Kubernetes namespace of tcream any pod that spins up in that namespace will uh, uh, automatically have the Nginx service mesh uh, sidecar proxy injected into it. Uh, so we can obviously do the opposite approach. If we wanted uh, to auto inject in all namespaces, except one or two or three or four, uh, we would leave enable namespaces empty and just uh, add the exceptions in the disabled namespaces uh, as well. Uh, this is for auto injection. You can also manually inject sidecars outside of uh, of this scope. But I just wanted to illustrate that the tcream uh, namespace will have auto injections of sidecars. So what does that mean then? Let's go around and have a look at the pods in that namespace. Uh, so I'm gonna get pods, but I'm gonna specify the namespace of tcream. How does that look? Well, I have uh, I have a, a few things here. I have T version one, T version two. I have the tcream service. I also have uh, an additional uh, pod, which is there for us to be able to do service to service communication a little bit easier. I'm going to step into that in a moment. And you see two of two here. The reason you see two of two here is because there are in fact two containers in this pod. It's the service itself and the auto injected sidecar. So that's why you have the two of two here. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, where am I? Um, OK, yeah. So I'm going to do uh, there, yeah. And we should have some YAMLs here as well. And we do. Excellent. So the one that we're going to play around with here is the nsm.yaml. So what's in that? It looks like this. Very simple. We're setting up a traffic split uh, YAML file. Uh, what does that mean? Well, the traffic split is useful for all sorts of, uh, of cool things. Uh, mind you, we're now inside of the service mesh, right? So if we pop back over here and have a look, that means we're dealing with these fellas now, right? So the, uh, the traffic split allows you to do things like uh, blue-green deployments, canary, et cetera, et cetera. Because uh, uh, you, can, you can specify, so you, know, you have your version one of the T service here, uh, but you've uh, recently developed version two and you're deploying that out. And you can start to either do a canary deployment, which is what we're going to do now, uh, where you start gradually increasing the amount of um, uh, of traffic that you're sending over to the version two of the service. Uh, the idea here being that you're obviously do, doing testing of your uh, of your version two of the T service uh, at several tiers before it comes close to the production environment. But once you introduce it into the production environment, it's typically a wise decision to uh, gradually move traffic over to it uh, to see if that increase, uh, increases the pressure on help desk or, or whatever happens. You'll obviously, uh, when you're doing this, you'll log the output of, uh, of the service and so on and so forth to see if there are any errors are occurring as this happens. But anyways, so we have these two services. We're currently weighting them 50-50 just, uh, uh, just to illustrate that we're distributing traffic on them. But we're only doing that if we uh, have a conditional match here. We want specifically to find uh, a cookie with a, a key val pair of version equals beta. If that happens, we're going to do the split. If we don't see this cookie in the request, we're simply going to send uh, route all the traffic to the T version 1 uh, and business as usual. So uh, do... Uh, let's see here. I'm not. I can't remember if I applied this uh, YAML file before we started this morning. So I'm just gonna do it again. It doesn't matter. Yeah, I had. Uh, so nothing changed. Everything is exactly as it, we were expecting it to be. So again, just to remind ourselves, uh, how does our distribution of pods look here? We have the T uh, version one, T version two, and the front end service. Cool. 
Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and step into the sleep container to do a service to service communication. So that's this fella here in the top one or not container pod would be the more appropriate name naming convention here. Uh, I'm simply going to step into the interactive terminal of that pod uh, in the namespace. And there we go. And you see again that our, um, our prompt changed. We're now inside of the pod. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is I'm simply going to uh, curl the tcream service directly. So that's the front end service there. And I do that by just uh, curling HTTP uh, tcream service on port 80. And we see we get a response fine. Uh, I'm getting that specifically from the tcream FT7, etc., etc., server. And if I run this request again and again, nothing changes. I'm getting the response from exactly the same server. However, if I, for instance, uh, I'll just copy out this command. If I run this command and I uh, into the curl request, I add a cookie of version equals beta, we should see a different behavior. And indeed we do. Oh, sorry. There we go. Uh, it's, I have another command I made this morning before the session that will show this a little easier. Oh, there. So you see, we're now seeing load balancing, if you will, um, between the, the two, because we have the 50-50 weighting. Uh, now, I didn't show you that as we were going through the configurations earlier, but the load balancing method that's implemented here is least time. So that means it won't be exactly 50 50 uh, as it would be if we were utilizing round robin, uh, but it will be somewhere in the vicinity of 50 50, assuming that the services are performing uh, in or around the same way. Leaf, did we um, lose your audio? My apologies. Uh, thank you for keeping me honest. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> I was just yabbing away here. Uh, yeah, OK. So um, uh, uh, what I have been talking to myself about for the last 20 seconds is uh, when can a non-Kubernetes tool be appropriate? Well, uh, first, let's uh, uh, recap. So a Kubernetes native tool can speak YAML natively, uh, can typically be deployed with uh, Kubernetes friendly tools like Helm and so on and so forth, and, uh, uh, and all of these good things. A non-native Kubernetes tool can also uh, be appropriate for usage within Kubernetes. Like for instance, when we're talking about Kubernetes ingress controllers from an Nginx perspective, we're talking about our two ones, which is uh, are based on Nginx open source, and of course the uh, counterpart, which is based on Nginx Plus. Um, these are Kubernetes native, but only by virtue of the um, uh, the, uh, the Kubernetes ingress controller module, which is a module that sits between the Kubernetes API and uh, our configuration and APIs on the Nginx side of things. Uh, and holistically together, they present themselves as a Kubernetes native tool. Take away the Kubernetes ingress controller component, and it's no longer a Kubernetes native tool, but it can still be appropriate for use in a Kubernetes environment. Uh, uh, and a lot of other tools uh, play similarly. So uh, our entire data plane portfolio is super, super useful in Kubernetes and absolutely fits neatly within a Kubernetes strategy, not least of which because they're so compact. Uh, so 
uh, well, so sm small in terms of story size, which makes them very, very quick to spin up and, uh, and convenient from that perspective. So you could absolutely use, for instance, uh, say, take an example, Nginx plus functionality as an API gateway, for instance, inside of Kubernetes without uh, uh, deploying it as an ingress controller. It may perhaps be a micro gateway sitting in front of a subset of your organization that needs certain policies at play. Perhaps you want to expose that uh, API gateway to a specific team so they can self-govern uh, how traffic should be routed to applications or services that they are responsible for. Uh, that pretty much concludes what I had uh, prepared for you guys today. So um, if we um, uh, if we have any questions pressing, then uh, we can uh, move along to that. Uh, I don't think there's any open questions on the Q&A at the moment. Um, well, let me just check if there's any on chat. No, it looks fine. Well, if there's, um, the, if you guys are anything like me, you may find yourself uh, an hour from now or a day from now or a week from now thinking, ah, why didn't I ask that question? And if that happens, uh, please feel free to reach out to, uh, to us. Um, we're, we're easy to find. Again, my name is Leif Beaton. Uh, you'll find me on the, uh, on the Nginx uh, web pages. And uh, feel free to drop me an email or whatever may be the case. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Leif. It was a pleasure having you here. And we hope to see everyone back at a future LF Live webinar. Uh, for now, we will say goodbye, and this recording will be available up on YouTube later today. Thanks, everyone.